Good afternoon, we have some good news today. And amongst that good news is celebrating our uh, young leaders who are hoopsters who provided us such joy and inspiration in the last several weeks. The Washington State uh, women's basketball team was ranked to finish last and ended up going to the playoffs, first time in three decades. Congratulations. The Eastern's men's team in the playoffs, the Gonzaga women's team had a great, great season. And of course, the Gonzaga Bulldogs men's team who gave us uh, arguably the best season in 50 years and clearly the best basketball game in 50 years in any league. And I know 50 years from now, when they ask about 2021, we will get to see say that we were there when the Gonzaga Bulldogs uh, pulled out a win in the last 0.1 second. What a thrill for all of us. And we know they're looking forward to a great year next year. Thanks for the inspiration to our hoopsters. I want to talk about our efforts against homelessness. Uh, we've certainly made big investments in helping people through a uh, housing crisis, but we know that even though we've had an eviction moratorium, it's kept about 75,000 people from becoming unhoused. There's more work to do. I'd like to thank the landlords and the, the property owners for their patience and understanding during this difficult time. And we know that despite our efforts, homelessness unfortunately has increased in Washington State because of the COVID pandemic. And since I rolled out a budget, and since the legislature started the session, really two new dynamics have taken place. One, uh, the COVID pandemic has forced more people into homelessness. And we now have a new source of funds, uh, thanks to the federal government and the leadership of President Biden. So we need to take both of those things into consideration now as sort of a new situation that exists. We know that services for those experiencing homelessness are critical, and I think this issue merits a new approach from our state government and our legislature, even though this is late in the session. Uh, we think that mutual investments and partnerships uh, going forward should focus on strategies, getting people uh, off the street and under a roof with dignity and privacy, and that these facilities can have access to services like housing counseling to keep people under a safe roof. Now, that being said, we hope that these increased investments will be made in mutual partnership with counties, cities, and towns across our state that actually are implementing these programs. So it is our hope and I believe legislators' reasonable expectations is that communities that would receive these additional funds that we will be proposing will have effective program strategies and implementation plans that will effectively transition people uh, out of our public parks and right-of-ways and into secure housing that has the privacy that we know has been uh, so effective in helping uh, people to a healthy living situation. I think those legislative expectations are reasonable. It's also fair that legislators, I'm confident as they consider future allocations, will ask for a reasonable match from local communities uh, to be able to, uh, to be in partnership with state investment. So I'm hopeful if we meet these partnership goals, we'll be able to get more funding than originally proposed in our legislative session to help people through homelessness. So specifically, I am proposing that the legislature appropriate federal American Rescue Plan dollars toward rapidly acquiring housing units, providing case management, and cleanup and rehabilitation of public spaces that have been used as encampments. This is an additional to the original budget requests I've made in addition to the significant commitments that have already been made by the legislature. The legislature has been working hard on this issue for some months, but I believe given the extent of this crisis and the availability of federal dollars, that we can uh, put our shoulder to the wheel in the final days of the session to do more than we're currently anticipated to doing. Again, with these expectations, of having a joint responsibility with local communities to make sure we actually have effective programs. With that, we have two local leaders, Kirkland Mayor Penny Sweet and Skagit County Commissioner Lisa Janicki. Mayor Sweet, uh, we'd like to hear your comments.
on the homeless crisis we were all facing in our communities in Washington. When President Biden proposed his American Rescue Plan, um, he said, the need to act is clear. It's in the lines at food banks, the small businesses that are closed or closing, and the growing number of Americans experiencing housing insecurity. The social and economic impacts of COVID-19 have exacerbated Washington's twin challenges of homelessness and housing affordability. These challenges affect every city and town in Washington, and the state and local governments must act together now to solve these problems. Without the state's direct action to provide rental assistance and foreclosure prevention resources, our overburdened homelessness response system will be even more catastrophically overwhelmed with the people and families who become newly homeless. Kirkland is already seeing an increase in tents in our parks and trails and open spaces. We see more RVs along our streets housing families and pets. Our neighborhood resource officers, behavioral health and human services staff are spending more and more time attempting to find shelter space and housing that simply isn't there. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we can provide homeowners and tenants financial support to prevent homelessness through evictions and foreclosures. We also have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to provide permanent supportive housing and quickly expand affordable housing by purchasing distressed properties. We need to act quickly. Everyone agrees the need is dire. Due to the pandemic, housing is now much more than simply shelter. Housing is a quarantine space, an office, a school, a daycare center. The pandemic has brought the world to a standstill and hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians are unable to pay their housing bills at a time when stable housing is more critical than ever. All cities have these problems and all cities need to be part of the solution. The cities can't solve this on our own. There are many potential ways to spend these new dollars, but the most effective way to help the most people is to invest them in providing housing for all Washingtonians. We need the legislature to invest heavily in affordable housing and homelessness. We urge maximum investment in rental and utility assistance, foreclosure prevention, grant support for operations and maintenance of permanent supportive housing housing, resources to vastly enhance shelter capacity, maximum investment in the housing trust fund, and more. This is a once in a century pandemic. It needs to a once in a century response. We must not squander the opportunity given to us through the American Rescue Plan. We must use it as President Biden intended to meet the most urgent needs of the nation and put us in a better position to prevail. We thank the legislature for the hard work to focus federal dollars and invest further state operating and capital dollars to address the housing and homelessness crisis this, that this global pandemic has made so much worse for so many people. We in local we in local government stand as your partners and are ready to put these resources to work here in Kirkland and in every community in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Commissioner uh, Jenicky. Good afternoon. I'm Lisa Janicki, Skagit County Commissioner and I'm currently chair of our board. Like all of Washington State, Skagit County deals with continually rising housing costs and the resulting increase in homelessness. In fact, just today, the Skagit Valley Herald reported that the median house price in Skagit is over $485,000. This is a 27% increase from just one year ago. Uh, further, Skagit County maintains one of the worst vacancy rates for rental housing in the state. Typically, we are below 1% of vacancy uh, units available for rent. In this highly competitive market, our seniors and other vulnerable populations are having to choose between paying their rent or paying for their medications. And there are far too many school children with no place to sleep, let alone log into those Zoom classes. So now more than ever, we must invest in affordable housing and shelter. Skagit County supports efforts to invest in housing and homelessness and asks that any additional funds are implemented with communities like Skagit in mind. We are also asking that the legislator trust mayors and county commissioners to know how to creatively use the local dollars to address housing and homelessness. So for example, we need this to pass House Bill 1069 to grant 
a temporary flexibility in the use of our REIT dollars, which better positions us to attract developers and capital funds for the creation of this much supported or much needed supportive housing. Skagit County knows we can't rely just on the state and federal government. Along with our city partners, we are taking action. We have allocated millions in local resources and partnered with the city of Mount Vernon to build a permanent supportive housing project because we believe a roof over one's head is the first step in treating addiction and addressing mental health issues. We have also committed county funding to support a new Skagit First Step Shelter which will be located in the city of Burlington on city property. This project will open in the next 60 days if we can close a modest operating budget gap. This, it will be a year round shelter for 50 of our most vulnerable community members. In Skagit County, we, we know how to work together to get things done. Additional resources and flexibility will allow us to expand our good work and to create the hope, dignity and security that our residents deserve. Soon the federal um, American Rescue Plan dollars will be available and we have this opportunity to make a significant one-time investment in housing and homelessness across our state. Uh, Governor Inslee, we are very grateful to you and the legislator for leadership on this very important issue. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to have two local leaders. You've pointed out this is a statewide issue. This is urban and rural, north and south, east and west. So we are hopeful that we can help communities across the state. And I know in the upcoming days that you will uh, work with legislators uh, to find a way to satisfy what their desires will be is to make sure these dollars are actually effectively spent to transition people off of public right-of-ways and actually into secure private housing. I know that's gonna be important. It will also be important to legislators to figure out a way to, over time, increase our housing, which is ultimately what we need. There are some density issues we have to consider in this regard. So I will look forward to your leadership. We're all gonna to have to work uh, uh, over time to try to get this done during the session. This is late in the season for these proposals to come to the legislature. But given the emergent crisis, uh, I'm hopeful that we will succeed. So thank you for your leadership. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, with that, I wanna to turn to uh, recent successes we've had uh, for our students, of having our students back in the classroom. I think there is cause for being thrilled about the progress our state has made in the last several weeks. I'm pleased to say that as of this week, Every school district in the state of Washington has reached agreement with their educators to return to the classroom in accordance with my emergency proclamation calling for real in-class instruction in the state of Washington. We're just delighted by this success. I wanna thank our educators, our administrators, our support staff, they've worked so hard on very tight timelines to come up with the plans to get our students back into the classroom. And I gotta tell you, it is a, just a delight to see the smiles on the faces of these students and teachers when they are back in the classroom. I was at Eleanor Roosevelt Elementary the other day uh, watching education going on there in the classroom. These are magic moments. We now are experiencing them by the tens of thousands across the state. And I think we ought to be joyous about the progress that we have made to now have this success to come into compliance with our, our, uh, our protocols. The professionalism has been abundant. It was during remote learning, and now it is in more instructional learning. And I wanna thank educators for their innovation. They continue to be innovative. They continue to come up with new ways to do this on site. And uh, we ought to be grateful on that. So good news for our students, educators, and this has happened very quickly. So we're, we're very happy about what we've been able to achieve. Uh, our vaccines. Uh, pleased to say that now more than 20% of Washingtonians are fully vaccinated. We have administered just about 3.8 million vaccination doses. This includes over 200,000 doses administered at our state max vaccination sites. Uh, two days ago, I toured the first federal FEMA community vaccination center 
in Yakima, this very first one in the country that we're doing in partnership with the federal government. It's going amazingly well. They're administering up to 1,400 doses a day, and it's right very close to underserved communities. We are intensely interested in having an equity in the rollout of our vaccine so that everybody gets a fair shot at the vaccine, and we have an equitable distribution in, in this location Four of our five state vaccination sites are now in eastern Washington, particularly given the challenges of the Hispanic community and the agricultural working community. And we're making real progress on that. Another thing I learned during that visit uh, was that this is not the only game in town. I went to uh, a uh, largely Hispanic shopping mall uh, later that day and saw a pop-up clinic, which is a walk-in clinic. So people can just walk up uh, and get vaccinated, and it's it's just open. It's so easily accessible. By the way, these max vaccination sites are also making appointments available by phone and in Spanish and other languages, and that's important for folks who don't have computer uh, access. And then while I was at that, that pop-up clinic, I saw a bus, and it had uh, a number of uh, folks that look like agricultural workers, look like they're on their lunch break, and I went up, I was gonna suggest they go over to the pop-up clinic to get vaccinated. And I talked to the driver and he said, well, that's great, Governor, except we all got vaccinated yesterday at our farm where we work. So you had the MaxVax site, you had a pop-up clinic, and we are actually going out where people work now and giving them vaccinations. So I'm really happy about these equity strides that we're making. Much more work to do. And I want to thank the second gentleman, Doug Imhoff, who was there with us at this very first site. The fact that he would come out here and listen to us about how to improve this, these efforts was really gratifying. And, and by the way, there are still improvements we're bringing to this effort. We think we need more uh, evening hours available at these sites. We think there's some more that we can do about providing information to this community in the Spanish language. We're actually going to double our budget to do uh, 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 PSAs to give people scientific information about this. So uh, good work's going on on both sides of the state. Uh, I saw a similar effort, of course, in Vancouver on the west side two days before that, too. So we've got this all over the state. There is a big concern I, I want to share with people, and that is our seniors in our state. We have over 305,000 Washingtonians today over the age of 65 who still have not been vaccinated even though they have been uh, eligible for several months now. This is extremely concerning to us because as long as we have thousands of senior citizens unvaccinated, unfortunately, we are going to continue to see fatalities in our state, which is just heartbreaking. And there's no reason for that we know this is a safe and effective vaccine. 90% uh, of the physicians have had the vaccine. They know it's safe. Uh, and so we are hopeful that all of us will, will become advocates with our family members to take the vaccine. Uh, if you've ever loved your father or mother or grandmother or grandfather, or uncle, aunt, neighbor, here's a really good time to show that love and talk to them about the, about the safety of this vaccine. Uh, I know people, to some degree, have wanted to stand back and see if it works. Well, we've shown it works. We just have not had significant health uh, problems associated with it. And we're saving lives like crazy, but we're still suffering these fatalities. We also are now going to ask the most important messengers on this to become uh, more vocal, and that's our healthcare professionals. These are the people that people trust, which is our own physicians, nurses, physical therapists, dentists, dental hygienists, chiropractors. And uh, this morning I had a meeting with uh, dozens of the professional organizations who you will see are now going to become more vocal, sharing their medical advice with their patients on a proactive basis to let them know that, you know, if I'm a doc, to let my patients all know that we really want you to get vaccinated. And I believe that's going to bear fruit because people trust. These are the folks saving our lives. They take care of our hearts, our joints, 
and now they're taking care of us in COVID. So I'm really appreciative of the health professionals that have already been so diligent, they've worked so hard, and I'm confident now we're gonna be successful sharing scientific information with, with their patients. We have unfortunately now um, increasing numbers in our state, as you know, both the number of infections and the number of hospitalizations is going up. Uh, we have concerns about that. As you know, uh, uh, Monday we will be evaluating the status of counties. We're concerned about several counties that may be in a situation to go back to phase two. We will have more to say about that Monday. But whatever happens, uh, this will be dictated by the numbers by COVID. And we'll be uh, evaluating that in the next several days. The reason for this rebound of these cases, we believe is a combination of two things. Number one, there are more uh, variants in our state. Those have been confirmed. The, no, the percentage of variants are in double digits of at least two variants in our state. And this is obviously concerning because at least one of these variants, there's evidence believe is more transmissible and potentially more fatal. Second, we're concerned that we all have been delighted by the daffodils and, and we've let down our guard to some degree. And the more folks that aren't wearing a mask, the more folks that aren't socially distancing, the more karaoke, karaoke parties we have, like I read about uh, in a county south of here that has now had a spike in, in part of that. Just letting our guard down is really, really dangerous, and we believe it is one of the reasons these numbers are increasing. So this is a critical moment, as it has been all year, to remain committed to those non-pharmaceutical interventions. The vaccine's great, but if these numbers skyrocket, that vaccine is not gonna bail us out. Other states now are seeing skyrocketing. Michigan, uh, by, of exponential increase. We just do not want our state to get into that situation. So we hope people will be careful. We hope people will get vaccinated. You can go to vaccinelocator.doh.wa.gov. It's uh, one of the most effective ways to, to, uh, to find a vaccine. It's been widely, widely shared. And we hope everybody will continue to pitch in. Uh, for a legislative update, a lot of things going on. I wanted to focus on two of the most critical bills that are responding to another existential crisis. COVID is one, but climate change is another. We know that climate change threatens the health of our children. We know that we can't run or hide from it. We have to defeat it. And we've had some progress on that. Last year, the legislature updated our climate pollution commitments by our state. And it committed our state to reaching the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. That means the state legislature has committed our state to reduce climate pollution by roughly 50% by 2030. That means we have less than a decade to get to that commitment. Our families, our communities are gonna suffer by climate change and they cannot afford going another year of not getting down to business to attack climate change. So we now have two major policy proposals that are pending in the Senate that may have votes today that will simultaneously reduce carbon emissions and create jobs in the state of Washington. Uh, those are the Clean Fuel Standard, House Bill 1091, the Clean Fuel Standard, House Bill 1091, and the Climate Commitment Act, Senate Bill 5126, the Climate Commitment Act 5126. So I just give you a quick brief of what those bills do. The clean fuel standard attacks our biggest source of climate pollution, and that's transportation. By requiring less polluting fuels, by making sure consumers have access to cleaner fuels. Uh, producing those fuels creates economic opportunities across the state of Washington for construction workers potentially building biorefineries for biofuels. There's a proposal in Grays Harbor people are looking at right now. For farmers in eastern Washington grow crops for biofuels, for workers thinning unhealthy forests, for using wood for biofuels, potentially in air travel. Uh, we had IBW members uh, uh, talking about the job creation opportunities. 
uh, in Anacortes the other day. We had the uh, a company that's opening up a plant in Burlington uh, making solar panels, uh, Silfab, one of the largest manufacturers of solar panels uh, in the Western Hemisphere. These are job creating opportunities in our state. We don't want them to see go elsewhere. The second bill, the Climate Commitment Act, addresses climate, clean air, and public health, as does the first bill. It does this by capping climate pollution, capping carbon pollution, very important. It requires that that binding cap be reduced over time. It invests revenues paid for by polluters into accelerating our transition to clean energy. This is a polluter pays bill so that the polluters pay to help us in this transition. It supports resilient communities by requiring air pollution monitoring in overburdened communities and a requirement to reduce it. This is a very powerful tool to address the environmental injustice that too many communities and BIPOC communities and communities of poverty have been suffering for decades. This legislation, if, if it passes, uh, would give Washington State arguably the, the strongest environmental justice laws on the books in the United States, something we can be proud of. And reducing disparities and impacts in our communities is very important to us. This bill will address that. Now, obviously, it's not going to solve all of our equity issues. It's going to be a decadal effort. But it does put us on a clear path to attacking this health concern and increasing equity. It addresses injustice, the injustice of pollution, and the health damage done by carbon pollution and all of the pollutants associated with carbon pollution. It's time that we stop letting our kids choking on fumes, suffering epidemics of asthma. And I do believe this is a year for Washington State to step up to the plate. We, we have no other options. This has to be the year of climate legislation. It's the right thing. With that, uh, I'm joined by uh, Lisa Fehrenbach and, our, and Nick Struley, Director of, uh, Executive Director of External Affairs. With that, you may fire when ready, Gridley. A few questions. Uh, first, Ryder, the governor, Lacey. California recently announced a plan to fully reopen their economy by June 15th if their vaccination and hospitalization trends hold. Is there a specific similar timeline you've all been considering for a full reopening? And in the meantime, with several counties facing potential rollbacks next week, is there a concern that just as people are feeling hopeful as vaccinations increase, that this will just lead to less compliance? And on a separate topic for the governor, are you aware of any interest by the federal government to transport unaccompanied children from the southern border to sites here to help relieve overcrowding down there? And have you talked to anyone in the federal government on this particular issue? Uh, we have had some vague uh, possibilities, but nothing concrete uh, in that regard. So we've had what I'd call vibrations, but nothing concrete and concrete regarding unaccompanied minors here. Um, so at the moment, uh, no, we haven't had any specific proposals from the federal government in that regard. In regard to uh, announcing some date, no, we have not done that, nor are we really considering that at the moment, because everything you would do right now would come with such a big if that it would be of marginal utility to people. Uh, you know, California said, we're going to do this if. Well, if you have a big if, we're not sure how that actually helps people. So we are going to continue on our course of making decisions based on science. We've had great progress in our vaccination program. We're very happy about that. And we have our metrics so we can continue to reduce transmission. That would be the intention. Now, I do believe we think there is a possibility of having some really good things happen this summer in the state of Washington. But we got to bear down to make sure that those will happen. Your second question, if I understand it, you were saying, does the vaccination success expose us to the, uh, the problem of overconfidence? Is that what you're asking me? Or, or did I not catch yeah, your not question? Catch question. No, I was just asking that with these counties that are potentially facing rollbacks, 
uh, there might be some frustration from people in those counties as they're seeing hope on the horizon with vaccinations increasing. If they see potentially three weeks of rolling back to phase two, is there a concern that there's just going to be less compliance because people are just frustrated at this point? I think it's the opposite because people will see if we're going to get back to phase three, it will help to get vaccinated. Talk to your seniors to get vaccinated and wear masks and don't go to karaoke parties. So, no, I believe it's the opposite. It'll create an increased incentive for people to, to join this mission statement, which, by the way, we know can be successful. Uh, look at Yakima. Early on, Yakima had one of the highest infection rates in the United States. But I went over there and worked with some of the local community. They dramatically increased their mask usage. They, had, they dramatically increased their compliance with some of their business activities. And as a result, they drove down their numbers like crazy. They were very, very successful. We know we can drive these numbers down if we put our minds to it. And now, if anything, this will increase, I believe, interest in putting our minds to it. So no, I, th I think it's actually the opposite. And I hope we'll be successful in this regard. Look, this is not fun business for anybody. Uh, business owners have been going up and down on these, these changing uh, rules. That's really traumatic for them. We understand that. But we cannot allow ourselves to go the route of one of these other states that have had these explosion of cases. And with these variants, I will tell you that there is concern in Europe when uh, this variant called 117, it's also sort of thought of as the British variant, when it gets to 50% of the concentration of the, of the different varieties, in several of the European states, it has become almost a vertical curve, which is terrifying. We do not want that to happen in the state of Washington. And the only way to do that is to keep these numbers low. So I think this is the right decision, difficult as it is. I would just like to emphasize a few of the governor's points. Um, you know, we are experiencing some pretty significant growth in several communities uh, within Washington, and and uh, that's in both case counts and in hospitalizations. So it's something we feel is really important that while we do want to look ahead, as similar to what California is doing, and we are just as interested in reopening and getting to that that phase of of the situation as anyone else. Uh, we think it's important that we be mindful to have the same principles, the same ideals, the same caution that we've had all along that has kept so many in Washington um, safe. And, and speaking of California, we are having a little bit of a different experience where uh, their case counts are plateauing and, in, and, and continuing to go down, and we're experiencing this blip at the moment. So we think it's important that we dig in and we really focus on how do we redouble our efforts around masking, around social distancing, and work with the leaders in these communities that are having these struggles, while we also keep our eye towards how we, how we continue to reopen the economy. And we don't believe in false promises in our state. Up next, we'll go to Laurel Demkovich with the Spokesman Review. Go ahead, Laurel. Hi, Governor. This is either for you or Lacey, maybe. Um, but speaking of the rollbacks in counties, we're in a situation in Spokane and probably a few other counties in the state where we may slide by on Monday to continue into phase three. But by the end of the week, we might start to see spikes due to Gonzaga, March Madness travel. So is there a chance that the Department of Health will be reevaluating these counties sooner than that three week mark. And if you start to see these spikes, how quickly will you send the county back after Monday? Well, we, the tune here is, is, is played by the virus, not the governor's office. It's the virus's numbers that direct these decisions at this point. This is on autopilot in a sense. We announced what our metrics were and, we, and basically the way this works is that on Monday, we will evaluate the most recently available full uh, numbers that are available in full. And the following Friday, that change, if any, would go into place. That's the way the metrics were set out. Um, just an addition that, it, you know, part of the plan is 
that um, the state Department of Health, as well as a local Department of Health, can move a county back at any time if we feel that's needed or warranted. Uh, though at this point, we are intending to stick with the review cycle uh, going forward. I hope people understand, too, these these decisions are not done lightly, but if you look at our numbers we had yesterday, we had a bit of an explosion yesterday, and, and when you recognize the consequences of a, of a resurgence of this, uh, these are serious decisions. We just have to take this virus seriously as we have all the way along, and by doing that, we have, as I've reiterated now, saved tens of thousands of lives in our state. We should continue on that commitment. Up next, we'll go to Jerry Cornfield with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Governor, I wanted to um, ask you about the Supreme Court. As you know, several weeks back issued a decision tossing out the state's drug possession law. Uh, lawmakers are working on a response right now that uh, includes uh, allowing folks to have personal amounts of narcotics like heroin and methamphetamine. Um, could you share a little bit about your thoughts on that decision, its impact on the state, what res and what response uh, was, you know you think you and the legislature should try to get done in the next couple weeks? Um, I understand you may be using your clemency power as well in the next few days uh, as part of the response. So could you discuss a little bit about the decision and what you think needs to be done? Well, my my role here is to help legislators through a very thorny and complex issue, and so. I will actually say less than I might usually about a subject uh, because I, I don't want to I don't want to make their job more complicated. So I'll just kind of briefly say I do think we should have a bill. I do believe that it should be trying to increase a health related response to the drug problems that people have that get, get them into the therapy that they need because we know that ultimately that is what is most effective in a way that simultaneously prevents associated crime, you know, out of the public sphere and the like. And I think there's some good ideas being considered by legislators about that, and I'll continue to work with them. So I'm going to hold my comments to that relatively brief recitation. All right. Up next, we'll go to Keith Eldridge with Como. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, Governor, I'm just checking on the judgment day coming up on Monday regarding the metrics for counties to remain in phase three. Are you considering making set exceptions for counties that are hovering very close to that threshold, uh, in, either in cases or hospitalizations? Are you willing to give some leeway to those who are right on the edge? Well, first off, this is not judgment day Monday. The score is the score. This score is, is determined by the COVID virus, not us. I won't be, be making any judgments on Monday. It'll just be looking at the numbers, and we've already announced the metrics. And I just want to reiterate that. This is not sort of a discretionary call by the governor here. And the numbers will be the numbers, and we will look at them. Uh, we don't anticipate, uh, you know, changing the numbers by tens or hundreds. Uh, once you start doing that, I don't know where you stop. So at least at the moment, we're not thinking of fudge factors here. I, we don't know where they would be. Up next, we'll go. By the way, they could go either way. On a fudge yeah. factor one way, you could end up with a fudge factor the other way, which may not make people happy either. So we won't be going that we'll direction. Going that direction. Okay. Up next, we'll go Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, Governor. Uh, sometime back, I believe you said that you didn't expect to re to have any requirements for vaccine passports. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, movement in other states. And now there's four state Republican lawmakers in the past couple of days who have asked for passage of bills that would bar any kind of requirement for proof of vaccinations. I'm just wondering if you've changed your mind on, the, on that at all. We haven't given any serious consideration of that. Uh, I think over time you might see private entities Airlines, others might, you know, might be adopting their own sort of requirements in their private businesses. That, that's something that is outside the can of, of government. So you may see that inquiry increasingly in your life, even if it's not a government activity. 
But we haven't given any serious consideration to that. All right. Up next, we'll go to Brendan Block with the Olympian. Go ahead, Brendan. Hi, Governor. Uh, two questions about the housing funding. Um, the uh, House of Representatives included about $90 million for a similar uh, sounding program about purchasing hotels and motels and turning them into housing. Would this funding be in addition to what's already been proposed and how much? Um, and then secondly, uh, who would be open to apply for this funding? Would it be strictly for municipalities or could nonprofit or even for-profit developers apply? Uh, what I'm trying to articulate is we think we need to be more ambitious, more aggressive, and larger in our commitments to this effort than we currently have on the radar scope in, in either chamber. I have willfully not put a number on this, but it's closer to the hundreds of millions than the tens of millions that I believe are necessary to respond to this crisis in its depth. And I think the public is demanding uh, and calling for a more urgent action. So I'm not putting a number on it. I don't want to be seen dictatorial. Again, this is a late request to the legislators, but I think the, the circumstances call for it. I haven't, in my own mind, um, restricted who would be potential beneficiaries. Obviously, the cities and counties would be in the first tranche. Whether there could be direct uh, commitments from the state to nonprofits, I haven't either ruled that in or out. I just want to provoke uh, more ambition at the moment during this session. All right. Up next, we'll go to Ian Smay with Crum2 News. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, yeah, Governor, I was just wondering, I know you said that you guys use the most recent numbers available, but I was wondering if you had a specific time frame that will be used on Monday when it comes to the data. And also here in Spokane, our regional health district has been dealing with issues in data reporting and having to change numbers back and forth based on investigation. So I was wondering, does the Department of Health have their own numbers or the, could the errors in our uh, data be causing some issue with that decision? You broke up there. Could you run that last couple of sentences by us? Yeah, so here in Spokane, our regional health district has been dealing with issues in data reporting and having to change numbers due to inconsistencies. We were just wondering if the Department of Health has their tracks their own numbers or if the errors in the, the local numbers might uh, impact that decision on Monday. Well, the, the numbers will be the most recent complete numbers that are available on Monday. So that's the numbers that will be making the call here. Now, there's incomplete numbers that come in for some period of time. We need to make decisions based on the complete numbers. Lacey, do you want to talk about that time frame? Uh, yes, so we will, as the governor said, use the most recent complete data that we have when the calculations are done. Um, and we, for um, the data systems for cases, I think you mentioned that there were some updates uh, potentially happening with Spokane Regional Health District. Uh, they report those to us through the Washington Disease Reporting System. So. Um, we do try to make sure that numbers are matching, and if that health department has concerns, they can uh, definitely reach out to us about that. All right. Up next, we'll go to Melissa Santos with Crosscut. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Governor. I was wondering, uh, now I think the climate commitment bill of yours is being passed either right now on the Senate floor or um, shortly. Um, I guess what I was wondering is, if you don't have the votes for that in the House, which the House seems to prefer a carbon tax method, how, how supportive or how willing are you to look at a carbon tax like maybe the Washington Strong proposal to um, get the funding you want for uh, transportation projects? It's very clear that the bill that has the by far, by far the best chance of passage both chambers is the Climate Commitment Act for a variety of reasons. And we need climate action this year. And we do need a legally binding cap on pollution. The goal here is to reduce climate change, to reduce carbon pollution. And the bill that actually does that effectively because it has a legally binding cap is the Cap and Invest Bill, which is the Climate Commitment Act. And that is the only bill that has that of the two that you mentioned. And that is very important to be able to effectively actually reduce carbon pollution, which ultimately is the goal here. I have supported putting a price on carbon in other years, 
And I'm supportive of putting a price on carbon in general. But I do have a belief of having a cap, a legally binding statutory cap, is also a tremendous benefit. And the uh, Climate Commitment Bill is the only bill that does that. And I think it has, by, by a long stretch, the best chance of getting uh, votes in both chambers right now. I also believe that the people who have been working on this have been Herculean effort to bring environmental justice to this effort. And you heard my comments about that. I'm very serious. The, the efforts to uh, focus uh, investments, to reduce inequities, the efforts to have a regulatory system which would prevent the concentration of pollution in these disadvantaged communities, this is quite rare. I'm not sure any other state has something like this which is very important to bring environmental justice to this. So this is an important part of this bill as well, and it has it. One quick second. We're having some internet difficulty before we go to the next question. I may note, I may note well, these two bills would bring us in parallel with the whole rest of the West Coast. One second, we're connecting to the internet again, so I might not be able to hear you for that section. Let's see if that worked. Okay. Josie Lam, uh, you may have heard this before, but one of the aspects of these two bills is that it would bring us in a parallel track with the rest of the West Coast. California, Oregon, British Columbia all have uh, similar bills that are, have been enacted now for several years, and they have had considerable success. There really is no reason Washington should not join the West Coast in those measures that we have things that we know that work. These things are tried and true. However, Washington's versions are frankly better than those old other states in a variety of different ways. We have learned from some of their experience, and that's why we have improved the environmental justice aspect of this bill in important ways. So sometimes it's good not to be first because you learn things, and I'm happy where we are on this right now. Up next, we'll go to Steve McCarran with Como. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, Governor. Thanks very much for uh, taking the question. This is kind of piggybacks on a question that Keith Eldridge asked you a little bit earlier regarding the decision on Monday about counties. Obviously, there's going to be some business owners and residents in those counties that are forced to move back to phase two that are going to be extremely disappointed, frustrated with uh, that move. Um, how are you going to handle that disappointment, the backlash that could come uh, from people that are forced to move back to phase two for up to three weeks? You know, what I hear a lot of from people on the sidewalk come up to me and say, thank you for saving lives in the state of Washington. That's that's what the feedback I get back all over the state of Washington. They know we're saving tens of thousands of lives. And we know that that has had frustration associated with it. We know that, too. But please do not discount the importance of saving lives in this endeavor at this critical moment. And we've made a commitment to doing that. And by and large, I believe Washingtonians believe that's an investment worth making, even with the frustrations that we have experienced. So, you know, when you say how we will deal with it, we'll deal with it with the truth and the commitment to save people's lives. And those two things, we've been steadfast, and that's why we've had significant success in our in the state of Washington. I also point out that these are not permanent conditions. We know we can improve because we've done it before. We have driven these numbers down before dramatically in fairly short order when our communities have come together to really put our minds to it and focus our intentions and wear a mask and do these things at work. This is ultimately in our control. This is the thing that 
Sometimes it, it's forget. This is not like the Martians have landed and taken over our state. We control this pandemic. It is under our control. That dirty little virus can't walk two inches from here to here without our help. We have control over it. And if in the next several weeks in these counties that will have frustrations, put their minds to it, we can get back in the saddle and drive these numbers down. And I believe there's a fair chance we're going to do that. So I hope people will look at this through the lens of the importance of the commitment, the confidence that we can get back on top of this virus, and the recognition that we have a vaccine that can also make this a very worthwhile endeavor. This does not have to be a permanent situation in our communities. I think we've got time for just one. I should mention one other thing, and I will say this, but it bears repeating. This is not Judgment Day Monday. I will not be making a judgment Monday. We are just going to count numbers Monday in public. You will be able to look at the, the, uh, the dashboard, and you will see the numbers just as well as I do. So that's all that's going to happen. I'm like the scorer at the referee's table. question will go to Nicole Jennings with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Nicole. Hello, Governor. Thanks for taking my question. If we do see counties go back to phase two, what will the restrictions in that phase look like? Will this be the same phase two that we saw in February, or would there be some additional new kinds of restrictions? I'm really sorry, but we lost about 70% of that. Could you try us again? Yes, let's see if that's better. Um, if we see counties go back to phase two next week, would that be the same phase two that we saw in February, or would we see additional restrictions that we hadn't seen before? Just wondering wh what kinds of specific restrictions we might be looking at. Well, they're the same ones that we previously announced. We don't intend to vary them. Nick, do you have anything to add to that? At, at this point in time, we're not contemplating any additional restrictions for phase two. I think the governor is absolutely right. It, it would be largely the same phase two we've used previously. I may also re reiterate, I know this will be frustrating to people, but this is not going to require the closure of businesses. There will be a reduction in capacity, mostly from 50 to 25 percent. Businesses will be able to remain open happily. Did you have anything you wanted to add? No, nope, the governor covered it. Thanks. All right. Any closing remarks? No. Again, uh, these are these are the best of times, the worst of times. The best of times, our kids are getting back in school. Our vaccine is coming on like crazy. It's working. It's safe. It's saving lives. And if we do our part to remain committed to this, I believe we're going to have substantial success in the upcoming months. And I believe we can do that. And I remain confident in our state. We're doing tremendous work in the state of Washington. We are leading the nation. We've been listed as the best state in the United States two years in a row, and I'd like to make it three. And if we continue our mutual commitment to ourselves, if we ask our fathers and mothers and grandparents to get vaccinated, and we wear masks, we're going to have a good shot being the best state three years in a row. And I believe we, we should go for that honor. Thank you.